As crises emerge, the type of crisis can reveal much about the risks posed to the organization by the crisis, potential stakeholder reactions to the situation and organization, and also help to guide crisis response strategies. Before making practical recommendations about how an organization should respond to the crisis, practitioners have to know what kind of situation they're managing. So why start with a focus on blame and crisis severity? In the field of crisis communication, understanding the situation is typically viewed as essential for selecting the best response strategy. In particular, the literature defines the attribution of blame for a crisis as a central factor to determine the appropriate organizational response. So blame attribution should be thought of as stakeholder evaluations of the fault for the crisis or the degree to which they hold the organization directly accountable for the crisis. We also start here because we've learned a lot about the impact of blame and severity of situations from traditional research and persuasion. How serious or severe the situation is also affects people's emotions, especially fear and anger. Negative emotions are more likely to occur during crises because crises create a sense of uncertainty and frustration. And the degree to which folks think that the organization is to blame, coupled with how bad the situation is, creates the heart of how much risk there is for an organization as a result of a crisis. So if we understand that blame combined with severity produces uncertainty for people, then it's not really hard to understand why crises represent a critical threat for an organization's reputation, its well-being, and potentially even its survival. If a situation evokes negative emotions about a crisis, stakeholders are more likely to blame the organization and the reputation is likely to suffer. However, if an organization responds well to a crisis that can mitigate the negative emotions and affect people's perception of the organization's, its actions, and how it's handling the situation. From the stakeholder perspective, we have to meet the stakeholders' expectations and needs. In short, we have to understand how stakeholders see the crisis to better anticipate their needs and how to respond ethically and appropriately. That's why the research connected to both crisis and persuasion tells us that blame and severity make sense as two of the most important factors influencing how stakeholders evaluate crises and the organizations involved in them. Most theories related to persuasion, risk, and crisis communication all make a common assumption. That is that different situations require different messages. In part, this is because of what we just talked about, that different situations create different stakeholder needs. In part, it's because it just doesn't make sense to respond the same way if the organization is at fault or if it's not, nor does it make sense to respond the same way if lives are at stake or if they're not. It's also important to remember that crises themselves may be complex. It's entirely possible that an organization in crisis might be dealing with multiple crises at once. So it will be important to understand the difference between the situation that caused the crisis and what may happen afterwards. We should think of the primary crisis as the triggering crisis for the organization, what actually causes the crisis's emergence. However, crises are often multi-layered, with new and different crises emerging that are directly tied to the primary crisis, but that are caused by other factors, including the organization's response to the primary crisis. Those are called secondary crises. Now, different authors will talk about different topologies for crises. However, for me, the types of crises discussed in this chapter not only best complement the body of research connecting crisis, type, stakeholders and crisis response, but also represent a very concrete way to understand crisis type. The topology presented is equally applicable to both primary and secondary crises, but we'll focus most of our discussion on the primary crisis and explore crises as transgressions, events, disasters, and reputational attacks, representing the most up-to-date and stakeholder-centric topology. First, transgressions. What's a transgression? As the name suggests, the organization is materially to blame for the situation. That is, the organization did something wrong. For example, Tiger Woods problems certainly started away from golf in his business, but they didn't remain there long. 
While transgressions vary in the potential impact on stakeholders, we should assume some stakeholder perception of severity for any transgression. By far, transgressions are the most studied type in the field because they're the basis for the most legislation, liability claims, and most likely to damage the reputation of organizations. But we need to note that just because an organization commits a transgression, it doesn't mean that they're a villain, just that fault is clearly attributable to the organization. So they come in many shapes and sizes. And let's take a look at some of the different types of transgressions. We'll start with the easiest kind of transgression to consider, illegal behavior, where the organization or public figure has done something illegal and been caught for it. In some cases, these kinds of behavior may not really amount to much more than a fine. However, in others, corporate illegal behavior not only brings down an organization, but can also fundamentally change laws. For example, in 2001, the Security Exchanges Commission in the US brought charges against Enron, an energy and commodities company, and it was one of the most shocking and widely reported ethics violations of all times. Not only did it bankrupt the company, but it also destroyed Arthur Anderson, one of the largest accounting firms in the world. It created problems for organizations like the Houston Astros, whose baseball field was named Enron Field because of the corporate relationship between the baseball team and its sponsor. But more than that, it resulted in fundamental changes to accounting law that was put in place in the U.S. and then had ripple effects globally as many countries doing business with the U.S. or U.S. multinationals also had to comply. So illegal behavior can result in both serious material and reputational problems for the organizations and even in entire industries. A second type of transgression is some kind of technical breakdown or accident. In this case, the organization didn't necessarily do anything wrong, but ultimately it's their responsibility because of the technology or equipment failure. These can be some of the most deadly and life-changing types of transgressions. A clear example is the MH370 flight disappearance in 2015 that we still don't really have any meaningful answers to. However, the list of major accidents include those like the Chernobyl disaster in the Ukraine during the 1980s, the 1984 Bhopal explosion where a pesticide plant run by Union Carbide exploded in India killing around 4,000 people, or more recently the Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh killing about 1,100 workers and injuring another 2,500. Another type of technical breakdown is recall. In the case of a recall, some defect is found in a product or brand, and it's suggested that they be returned to the manufacturer. These happen all the time. In 2015 alone, there are 51.26 million cars recalled globally. Yet a simple recall doesn't necessarily prompt a major crisis for organizations. This is the difference between a problem or an issue and a crisis. But one of the most problematic recent ones from a reputational standpoint was the Volkswagen emissions crisis, where it was discovered that the company had misrepresented its emission trials and something like 86,000 cars were recalled globally. In part, this emerged as such a massive crisis because of the naughtiness. It wasn't just a manufacturing mistake, but there was deception involved. But more than that, because the brand had been synonymous with quality and integrity for so long, this fundamentally violated people's expectations. But we'll come on to both the organizational and stakeholder factors in another podcast. The next type of transgression is what's called mega damage. And this is a technical breakdown like we discussed earlier, but with such massive damage or loss of life that its effects are likely to be felt for years to come. An example of this is the Exxon Valdez, where the ship's captain fell asleep and ran the tanker to ground in an important part of the Alaskan coastline in terms of biodiversity and the economy. 25 years on from this, and the region is still feeling the effects. While many of the species in the area have recovered after the accident, there are species that have not recovered and seem unlikely to recover from the result of the damage. Another type of transgression are accidents or recalls that are the direct result of human error. 
While the Exxon Valdez fits into this category, it better fits into the mega damage category. But another example of this kind of crisis was the 2013 Spanish train derailment caused by a driver going too fast into a corner and ignoring the safety regulations for that particular stretch of track. Of the 222 people aboard, 79 died and 140 were injured, so the devastating proportion of loss of life involved makes it stand out. There are accidents where people fail or equipment fails, and those are absolutely transgressions. But there are also accidents where decisions have been made knowingly that place some stakeholders at risk. While we talked about the Grenfell case during the issues management decision-making discussion, I bring it up again here because it represents one of the clearest examples of this kind of transgression where along the line, an organization or potentially multiple organizations made decisions about the cladding that ultimately put residents at risk. This is one of those types of crises that will result in years of problems because a large number of buildings in the UK have the same kind of cladding. So this essentially goes from a single misdeed to an industry-wide crisis affecting many different organizations and many thousands of stakeholders. At this point though, you should have a pretty clear sense of what counts as a transgression along with a group of case examples to demonstrate the point. Like I said, in the case of a transgression, it's about a clear and direct line of blame that can be applied to an organization or public figure, regardless of whether there was physical damage or not that occurred.